Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks for joining us. We've got a lot to get to today. Um, lots of changes happening in the market, and I'm sure you each have interesting perspectives to bring to that conversation. But to start, since this is a conversation about CEOs and leadership and insights, um, each of you has taken a pretty unique uh, way to get to the CEO role. Kanal, you worked your way up. Sarah, you came in sort of as an outsider, and Bill, uh, <laughs> maybe you'll want to explain like how that whole thing worked out. But um, but I'm just wondering like how your stepping into the role informed your management style and what you've learned as a leader as a result. I'll start. Uh, so it's now. 10 years uh, as CEO of Apex, uh, and if my wife was here, I promised her two years and I'm out. So eight years afterwards, I'm still sitting in the seat. Um, and my journey to, to become the CEO of Apex, I actually tried to buy Apex uh, from the parent company, Peak Six, uh, in Chicago. Uh, I was not successful in acquiring the company, but I was successful, obviously, in getting this, this role, and it's been amazing. I mean, we, we you think 10 years ago, the clients of Apex was Wealthfront and Betterment, a company called Motif. Anyone remember Motif? Uh, it was sort of the OGs of fintech. Um, and you know, the, the, the original part of what we were doing was like, hey, how do we disrupt this industry? How do we help uh, every person on the planet invest in their future? And it's been pretty cool. Um, over the last 10 years, kind of realizing that dream, realizing that purpose, Today we have roughly 25 million people that we help um, on an end, end investor perspective and a, close to 300 different institutions. All right, excellent. And we're partnered with Bill, which is, which is very exciting for us. Um, so I'm much newer to the party. I am coming up on my third year, uh, reaching three years as CEO at Betterment. I came actually from the media business where I spent 25 years um, building iconic brands like SpongeBob. And for those of you with little kids, um, Paw Patrol, those were some of my claims to fame. Uh, and coming to wealth management, it was sort of an opportunity for me personally. I was the chief operating officer of those businesses, so I sort of worked my way up through strategy and operating businesses, first growing businesses for a decade, and then transforming them as sort of digital started to eat our lunch. And so the interesting opportunity for me here was really kind of threefold. One was about great brands, and I had never heard of Betterment when I got here. I got a call, and I said, Betterment, what's that? Um, and as I dug in and learned more about the brand, I thought there was a really aspirational mission here around bringing accessibility and making people's lives better, bringing things that, that wealthy people had sort of to a more mass uh, audience. And I thought that was a really exciting opportunity, and I could build on my brand building background. The second thing for me was the idea of being on the right side of the digital transformation. So had had you know a lot of years sort of watching Netflix come after cable television and realized the many, many things we did wrong during that transition and how hard it is as an incumbent to sort of fight against startups. And so the idea that I could be on the other side of that transformation was just a really, really fun idea. Um, and I was always personally interested in investing, um, but I didn't have a background in it. So I think to answer your question about my management style, I think I've become a better listener in this role in large part because I, there's really a lot I don't know. And my team and particularly my executive team knows a lot more than I do about wealth management, about technology, about how to build things. And so really getting like the right voices in the room and allowing for kind of ground up building something has been a very different experience for me from a sort of hierarchical media, big company background. Yeah, and I've been at Morningstar now 26 years, and you know the story of Morningstar is much like the story of uh, many advisors in the way that our business has changed to support the way investing has changed. So when I first arrived at Morningstar, I was right out of college, and it was a mission that really kind of drove me, and I wanted to be there because there's always a focus on the investor and helping the advisor and really empowering those who were trying to drive great financial outcomes, and that's true today as well. And so one of the things that I love about leading a firm like that is it's still very mission-driven. But you also realize that the world around you is changing and does change. And so just as advisors have changed, and we're going to talk about 
how investors have evolved, Morningstar has had to evolve as well. And so part of the journey of being a leader is to figure out how do you keep what's authentic and core to what you do while also being realistic about the way the world is changing and um, the things you need to do to um, you know, be successful there. And this conference is a perfect example of that, right? Like think of the typical advisor conferences you've gone to 15, 20 years ago, even pre-COVID, and look at where you are today. And so we've had to evolve in, in that sense, but you don't lose where you started and your roots. And, it's kind of a fine balance, and for me, it's been fun, because I started when we were 200 people, we're more than 10,000 now, and so it's super fun to have been part of that and try to you know, keep it vibrant in that sense. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about um, how the investor has changed. Um, Sarah, you mentioned sort of the democratization of these tools for you know, the everyday investor, and, and Bill, you know, all of your partners, um, a lot of them are working on uh, enabling people to be more active investors. Um, so how is that play, how is that playing out now as those businesses are maturing, as those investors are maturing, and what are they looking for today? Well, I, th I think if you look at our data, and we, we just... Um put out a new study today that sort of shows how advisors and uh, investors are changing. And our data really supports the fact, A, that obviously there's a wealth transfer going on, B, that as part of that wealth transfer, your clients are much younger than they used to be, and C, the things that they care about are also different, right? And so um, I like to tell the story. Some of you may have heard this. When I first set out to hire a financial, financial advisor, um, being at Morningstar and having grown up as an analyst, I love to invest myself. And so I take a lot of pride in trying to do that part myself, but my wife is not as interested. And so when we decided to look for an advisor, a core part of it was that she was going to make that choice, that it was because it, she wanted someone she could be comfortable with. And I like to tell the story that in that first round of meeting the advisors, everyone who came in looked at me. Nobody looked at my wife even though she was the decision maker in that particular decision. And we didn't hire anyone from that initial pool. And I, it's, it's such a good metaphor for, I think, the way things are changing. And I think about even my kids today. Um, my oldest is now 18. He's starting to invest. Um, he, he just let me know that he's close enough to take uh, full charge of his brokerage account. So good luck on that front. Um, based on his emotion in the last few hours and Bear's loss, uh, I think he's going to be an emotional investor as well. But Th th those are the people. He could you're try betterment, actually. What's that? He could try betterment where he yeah. plans for the future. You know, he doesn't, no knee jerk reaction. He's a Morningstar subscriber. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, that, that, that's the reality. And, and, and the cool thing is there's all kinds of new things and interesting things that you could be exposed to private equity, alternatives, but they come with all the same risks and potential rewards of sort of the long only strategies. And we can talk about that as well. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll jump in. I, all three of us were talking backstage. We all have children right around 18, and we think about our kids today. Think about the access that our kids have to invest versus looking out there. A lot of folks around my age, there was no ability to invest when I was in college. Um, and you think about what we've done as an industry to actually lower the barriers, zero commission, fractional share trading, um, amazing services like Betterment uh, to help folks um, with small balances get going with their investing lives. Um, what we didn't do a good job of over the last, let's call it last two or three years, is this is the first time a lot of the folks, so there's, like I said, 25 million end investors. Uh, there's about 5 million of them are Gen Z. There's almost 10 million are millennials. So you have a very young cohort that we support. And it's the first time that, for many of them, that they experienced a downturn in the market. Uh, it was really interesting to see what they did. So the popular belief was they're all going to run out and go find a human advisor and uh, close their account, and that's not what happened. Uh, less than 5% of the accounts actually closed, um, number one. Number two is they dollar cost averaged into the downturn, which was amazing for me to see that at a young age. Um, uh, and then lastly, um, they moved from active trading to passive. 
right? They saw that they're not actually good at stock, you know, uh, picking stock, and so they moved into more passive investment portfolios. Um, but the one part I don't think we've done a good job as an industry is teaching, right? Um, on the advisor side, on the fintech side, uh, especially for that younger generation, we've got work to do to actually educate them. And then the second part of you know, the work we have to do is uh, you know, lots of focus today on active to passive, but then in passive, people want to invest in fixed income. Um, my son, who's you know, Tulane, is a senior, 21, he's like, Dad, I want to buy T-bills. Like, he can't because he doesn't have enough money to buy a T-bill. Like, the notion of a fractional share of a T-bill doesn't exist today. Um, he wants to access alts, but he's not an accredited investor, right? Uh, and so there's work for us to do in the industry. One is to teach, okay, how do those things fit into a young person's portfolio if they do? And two is to kind of create access, responsible access, but access to those things um, to kind of round out folks' por portfolio, especially at a young age. So I might take a little bit of a counterpoint, which is I'm not sure that what, what clients want is so different. I think, I think there are things that need to improve. For example, they have a higher expectation of technology, and I think that, you know, they, they grew up on Amazon and Google, and they're not going to accept any less from their investment platform. But I think fundamentally, what they're looking for is they're looking for a plan, that they're looking for reassurance that they're on the right track. Trust is a huge factor that hasn't changed. I think transparency is at an all new high, right? Because, to, you know, to your point, they have the direct access now, and so, they want to know what they're paying for and that their service, the value of the service is appropriate. They want to pay low taxes. Everyone's always want, you know, everyone wants to pay less taxes. So if you can minimize their tax bill, that's always been good prior generation and now. Um, and, you know, yes, there are, there are plenty of asset classes to access, but I think at the end of the day, you know, the value of the advisor has become only more powerful coming out of the YOLO 2021 where, you know, game stunk to the moon moment, right? The, these, these young investors sort of thought they knew more than they knew, and a lot of them got hurt. Right. And so I love the move from active to passive. You know, we believe in really long term planning and, you know, saving is the objective. And I think so, you know, I, I think really like their expectations of how technology and service come to life may be maybe getting higher because they know they can have better. But I don't think fundamentally what they're looking for is so different, right? They, they want a plan and they want long-term security and they want help understanding how do I set myself up for a successful financial future? So I feel like a lot of these individual investors that we're talking about that you know, are served by services like Betterman or are served by uh, partners of Apex you know, are not necessarily those that are looking for advisors right now. And I'm wondering you know, what you would tell them the value of that kind of service would be? And also, like, how do we democratize that and make the same types of advisory services available to those who, you know, might just be starting out? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start this one just because it fits squarely in our wheelhouse. I actually think they are looking for advisors. And the interesting thing that we see is a real sort of graduation moment. And that the, the beauty of the, you know, when we first launched, because we had both a retail product and an advisor solution, I think the advisor community was pretty skeptical because they thought we were competing against them. And I think that's really what we're seeing in the data is that that's not true. What we're doing is we're offering an on-ramp before the advisor community is ready to take on those customers and just starting to build good habits of regular saving, dollar cost averaging, and because we've been able to automate a lot of that work, we can take on customers with a lower average balance. And what we're seeing is the minute that there's a life event, right, there's a marriage, there's a, you know, any kind of partnership, there's a home buying moment, right, though they're a baby, these are the times when they stop and they say, okay, now I want to think about 
a human, an advisor. And we've always, well, maybe my predecessor less so than me, but um, I've had a financial advisor for over 20 years. I, I love him. And, and like your wife, like I picked him and my husband participated, you know, came along for the ride. But, you know, I love him and, and it's, it's the longest relationship in my life other than my husband probably. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that customers, they do, they graduate and they hit a certain wealth moment where they go, you know what, I would like to talk to an advisor. And I don't see that as competition for us. I see that as how can our technology now empower the advisor community to serve those customers when they're ready. Yeah, the, the thing I would add to it is what I see is that, you know, there's a lot of focus on two groups. One is what I'll sort of call the boomer group, and it's obvious why that is. They, that's where the wealth is concentrated, and that's where many advisors have historically done most of their work. And then young investors. It's always fun to write about young investors and talk about what they're doing and, you know, their crypto foibles or what, what, what have you. But I think what's interesting and often overlooked is the middle. And I, 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 I think when, when you look at it, if you're an advisor today and you're really looking to grow your business, the Gen X group is probably the most interesting one to be focused on because not only are they inheriting the wealth from, um, you know, their parents, but when you look at younger investors, they're often learning and getting word of mouth advice from the Gen X group. And so when you look at the big transfer of wealth, if I'm an advisor, that's where I'm focused. It's fun to talk about the younger investor, and I think there's a longer term opportunity there, but I think you do that too by focusing first on sort of that middle there. Yeah, the, the only thing I'll add, just, just a straw poll, how, how many folks in the audience work for an advisory firm? Just show of hands, okay, m most people. How many of you, to the extent you'll admit it, how many of you actually have a minimum of at least 250,000? Okay, so industry's kind of broken. The, the plumbing of our industry is broken, right? Um, why do we have the minimum? Right? We talk about young folks, largely they're not using an advisor because they can't, right? Our industry has basically said, hey, when you actually have real money, come see me, right? And until then, go play with you know, some robo or some fintech platform. Okay, it's not playing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get beat backstage. Yeah, he's he in serious that. trouble later. <laughs> um, but, you know, look, this episodic advice is a word that's kind of thrown around. This notion of when there's events in someone's life that someone needs to step in and help, whether, you know, young, old, Gen X, um, we don't have a right. The, the model isn't right yet. And part of the reason there's three providers in terms of infrastructure industry, you know, part of the reason is that the infrastructure, the, you know, the, the platforms aren't yet there to support sort of hybrid, like a real hybrid, not, you know, sort of, hey, we're going to have a robo with some person overlay. Uh, this notion that you can actually scale and be able to support someone that has $100,000 uh, through human advice we're not there. And part of it is we've got to lean, continue to lean in technology to make it such that all the stupid stuff we do in the industry that takes up time, opening accounts, NIGOs, all the silly things that happen in the industry, we get rid of, or at least mitigate. Can I hire you to be one of my salespeople? Because that's my pitch right there. He'll be available in I two years. I just redeem myself. <laughs> OK. So, um, one of the things that I, I feel like we're kind of talking around when we talk about these cohorts, though, is uh, they're much more active and they're much more engaged. And I feel like, you know, they want to be, they're more like you, Kanal, in, in terms of they, they want to be more uh, a part of the decision making as opposed to relying just on someone else's advice or, you know, asking someone else to do the hard work for them. And so I'm wondering like, what you're seeing from that perspective and what advice you would give to the advisor community that's here. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of, one of the things that we see all the time and, and reason why a lot of investors come to Morningstar is for validation. And when I think back to 10, 15 years ago, there were many things that I think advisors were worried about, robo-advisors. I remember the first time that word came about, everyone was like, oh, if you're working with a robo-advisor, not going to come anywhere near you, right? Or this notion that you would have multiple providers. It just was not done. And so what, what, what I think is, as an advisor, one of the things you can be proactive about is helping your clients think about where they can get validation for some of the decisions that you're making for them, and to not be fearful of that. 
Uh, historically, I've always sort of seen it's hands off. I'm the smart one. Uh, I know what I'm doing. Don't ask me questions. People just have so much access to information, and that's a good thing. It should actually help you help them execute their plans. And so I would just say to embrace that and to really think about this concept of how you guide them to validation, because there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, I, I'll just add, um, most of the money's with the boomers, and on average, they just want the money to sit and do its thing. You know, they grew up in a generation where there wasn't as much transparency um, as there is today. And um, what we have done for boomers isn't gonna work for the, the younger generation. Right? I think this notion of transparency that Sarah talked about, about education, um, people, they have their phones, you know, I, we all, many of us have kids, they're on their phones at all times and they're looking to understand how things work. Um, and there's an opportunity there for us to lean in and actually teach them how a plan is put together, right? How investments are made, like what, why we made decisions as an advisor as to what, you know, where the money is. Um, you know, being invested. And we got work to do there, because I think there's still this notion that, like, I got it, right? I'll take care of your money and um, you set it and forget it. Um, this notion of episodic advice when things happen, it's just an opportunity for us to lean further in. Um, I see it just, again, I, that active to passive move. People want advice. They want people to teach them how to better, better invest. Um, and it, it's getting better, um, we certainly have a long way to go. But there are, there are pitfalls, and so the example you use is interesting because I would argue that one of the reasons boomers may be stuck with things is because the friction to doing things was so high, right? And the friction has disappeared. And so if you think about it, if you have young, younger clients today, their ability to move things, uh, e even you look at just something like Silicon Valley Bank and how that happened, it's because the friction was taken out of the process. And apply it to your own practice and think about how a young client today may be interacting with you and how they may be able to move their money or how they have a view into their money and think about how maybe an older client did and it's vastly different. And so you gotta be ready to do that because on the one hand, you're gonna draw attention and get people to work with you by removing friction, but that also gives some power to the end client, which I think is a good thing, but it can generate all kinds of side effects that maybe you have not considered up to this point. So one of the other things I wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, a couple years ago, the numbers just went up and everybody was a genius. And we've gone through this period over the last two years where that's no longer the case, um, where the uh, expectations and shifts around returns on certain asset classes have changed pretty dramatically. Um, I'm wondering how that changes the expectations of clients and how that changes how advisors should interact with them or um, set expectations for them. Well, I think the good news is we've been saying for a while to clients, expect lower returns. And for better or worse, if you look at rolling 10-year returns, they've generally been pretty good with possibly now the exception of fixed income, which has gone through a bit of a more significant uh, bear market. You know, in our view, when we look at things, the markets are generally fairly valued on the equity side. Um, certainly, you can say there's some pluses or minuses. But fixed income is far more attractive than it has been in a very long time. And then you certainly have alternatives and other things coming up that present some opportunities. But our, our message ultimately is, you know, regardless of all that, it's fun to talk about it and, 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 and all that stuff, but having a long-term plan is what matters. Sarah talked about saving. If you don't save, you can be like Warren Buffett, and it's not going to matter, right? Saving is fundamental to, you know, good long-term outcomes. And so what I'd say is the investing environment today from our perspective is a pretty decent one. If you're looking for long-term returns, I have no idea what's going to happen over the next 12 months or 18 months. Uh, good luck if you do. Um, but, you know... Uh, I, I think it's generally good news that some of the animal spirits have sort of been washed out of the market a little bit, and it's certainly a better time to be investing today than it was two years ago. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, you know, again, diversification, a long-term plan. I think, you know, the thing that has probably in the last, 
you know, six, nine months been most interesting for us is the reemergence of cash as just a really important part of the kind of savings conversation and the idea that cash is part of your long term and saving is part of your long term investing portfolio. And so how do you think of that not as cash is for today and investing is for later, but the whole thing comes together in a plan. And so, you know, we, for example, have seen great opportunity in offering a high yield. Right now, we're offering 4.75% yield on a cash account. That's an incredible opportunity um, for customers, and we're offering even more promotionally. Um, but it's a, it's a great opportunity for customers. Back to the transparency point, right? Some of the larger institutions for years have kept some of those cash rates low, and it's left room for, you know, startups and fintech companies to come in and say, let's give the end user user more of their fair share. And I think for advisors, to me, this is actually a great moment because there's an opportunity to really get more visibility into that cash that maybe your clients are holding away and are holding in their bank account and to bring it over and wait for that moment when they feel more comfortable with what does the next 12 months look like and with a dollar cost averaging plan and stuff like that. So I think that's probably the, the most interesting you know, cha- you know, 12 month change we've seen, I would say. Well, and the only thing I'll add to that is, is part of that is just the ergonomics. So I'm, I'm not just a partner of Sarah, I'm a client. Um, <laughs> I use Thank Betterment. You. And the ergonomics between my bank account and Betterment's, uh, the, the platform is amazing. I can click a button and move money back and forth. Uh, and I don't want to say chase yield, but y- you can move that money around. The, the friction that was there 10 years ago, five years ago, is gone. Uh, and I, I, we see the exact same thing. A ton of the assets move to cash to, to chase a safe 5%, 4.75% um, versus the risk of being in the market and being down, especially, again, for that younger cohort that lost over the last year and a half after you know a almost 10-year bull market. Um, and the ergonomics of allowing that people to move the cash from a bank account into this brokerage or advisory account um, has created an opportunity to, again, get your arms around not just the investing side of that individual, but you know, the sort of banking side of that individual. And so most of what we talk about is wealth management and investing, but when you think about someone's life, there's, you know, there's banking, there's insurance, right? There's obviously investing. Um, most of what we talk to, to folks about is just the investing part. Um, and I think the connecting the dots across this convergence that's happening is going to create opportunities for those advisors that are leaning in. One of the things that keeps coming up is um, interest in alternatives um, from the client base. And, you know, Bill, you mentioned there just isn't the infrastructure there for that today. I'm wondering what needs to be done to have that change and if you're you know, seeing a movement from that perspective. I, I can start. So, you know, I think the two asset classes, you know, the great part is accessing equities or options, um, ETFs, mutual funds. We've done a good job. It's democratized. People can get access pretty easily. Um, they can access bond funds so they can get some exposure to fixed income. But like I said before, it's really hard uh, to actually buy munis by T-bills unless you are high net worth. Um, we're about to roll out fractional fixed income uh, in the next two weeks, which is to allow people to just put a dollar amount in and buy a fraction of a T-bill. Uh, and so part of that is just, again, lowering the barriers to entry um, on the fixed income side. On the alts, we got work to do, right? Because it ties into the accredited investor um, there's certainly suitability challenges there, right? You're talking about a young person. Should they really be putting money into a private equity firm or venture capital? Right? It's debatable depending on how much they have. Um, but part of it, you know, there's, um, there's the, you know, actually the rails to move the money around and to actually place the investment. But the process to actually open the account is really difficult. It's still very difficult, really manual, as many of you that, that you know, support alts out there know. The process is not easy. Uh, and part of it's you know, rules, regulations in our industry. And part of it is just the Byzantine way that we have historically always done things. That's the part I think we can get right. The rules, regulations are a little bit more difficult. Yeah, I, I think there's one other thing we need to get right, which is 
let's, let's be candid. Like most alternatives that have been available to advisors have not been great. If you look at our data, it sort of shows that they've been hyped up and they have not delivered. And even occasionally when you have a strategy or two that do really well, they gather assets so quickly and then they bomb. And so I, I think that has to be solved. And the other thing that has to be solved really is the way you talk to your clients about alternatives because there really is a liquidity issue when it comes to alternatives. And Bill touched on it, and I think people don't realize it, but you don't get that instant liquidity. You may be called to invest at times that are inopportune from your perspective as well. And so all, all I'll say is the allure of sort of alternatives has existed through my 25 plus year career. I've heard it over and over again. I tend to hear it the most when there's a particular asset class going really well, but as you heard earlier, Instacart was at 55 billion. Uh, now it's seven, eight billion, so you don't hear people talking about it as much today as you did two years ago. And so buyer beware, the solutions need to be a lot better. And I'd just say that um, as in the public markets, um, you know, our data suggests, so we own PitchBook and our, our, our data suggests that there's a small number of PE and venture firms that tend to take the majority of the spoils and then everyone else kind of just does like the market, and so you're kind of indexing for all practical purposes without liquidity. I'm skeptical. <laughs> I'm wondering if, uh, if crypto matters nowadays. It, it seemed to be a big topic this time last year when I was here, and um, don't really see as much representation as, as there was 12 months ago. So I know we take a different view on, on crypto uh, from you, Kanal. Um, you know, my, my view, our, our view on crypto is that it's an asset class that's here to stay, um, but that there's, you know, not all assets within crypto are created equally. And I think the, the problem in, back in the, you know, 2021 sort of crypto boom was there was a lot of me there was a lot of mess in there, right? There was a lot of fraud. There was a lot of bad actors, um, and so it's not. I think it gave sort of crypto the asset class a bad name. We think about it as this is a new technology that is going to have impact, and whether that impact is in entertainment, whether it's in finance, like where that impact is, I think we don't know yet, and it's early innings. So we actually launched a couple of crypto portfolios on the theory, back to diversification, on the theory that if our customers wanted to have a little bit of exposure to the asset class in a diversified way, um, that was, that we would offer that to them as an option and then we were pretty heavy handed in our advice over the top and said, look, don't put more than 5% of your, of your investable assets here. This is about a flavor and a diversification play and a long-term play. And so I think uh, through a long-term lens, we still think there's some there there, but there's still a lot that has to shake out beyond sort of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I think what's, just to finish the thought, what's going on with some of these potential ETFs and all of this regulatory environment, I think we're gonna, we're gonna see a little more movement as some of the regulatory environment settles. Yeah, it's certainly controversial even within Morningstar. My colleague Lee Davidson's probably more bullish on it than I am. We've had some debates uh, about it uh, a, 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 a few times. I, I think you touched on something important, which is your clients are always gonna to wanna to play with a little bit of their money. And I just wanna say that I think that's okay. Sometimes, um, you know, you're trying to kind of manage their assets so closely, and one of the downsides, I think, to have kind of moved to a world that is so heavily indexed is sometimes your clients aren't as engaged with their money as they maybe could be, because it seems really far to them. And so I always encourage advisors to think about maybe having a small portion of assets, 5% or less, or what, what, whatever it is, which you kind of agree with your client is play money and has some flexibility for them to engage and kind of enjoy things a little bit more. But um, yes, you can call me a skeptic on crypto myself and um, uh, I, I will not be diversifying my portfolio with it anyway. <laughs> uh, look, the only thing I would add is uh, we were knee deep in, in crypto. We uh, started a company called Apex Crypto a number of years ago. We have since sold that company uh, and the, the premise of the company was, you know, sort of akin to what we do, is create a platform that, that responsibly allows for retail investors to invest in crypto. Um, I think, aside, uh, Sarah mentioned Bitcoin, Ethereum. 
I think the challenge right now is, uh, is the regulatory environment, right? What's a security, what's not a security? Um, and I don't think that's gonna get solved anytime soon. Um, and as a result, there's sort of apathy uh, on one side and I think indifference on another side and I think fear uh, is kind of a third leg of that stool. Um, and I think until the SEC, CFTC, whoever it is, the regulatory body that's gonna take the lead sort of lays out, okay, what is the security and what's not? The operators, us, like the, we're gonna bear the risk, right? You take, you wanna take Dogecoin and put it into your client's portfolio, you're bearing the risk of, of that being, ending up being a security uh, and you offered it to somebody um, not under the guise of security. So I think until that plays itself out, um, we're going to see that same apathy sort of sit uh, for the time being. It is kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario, though, because even if you're a regulator a year ago, nobody wanted anything regulated. Now everybody wants everything regulated. So it's <laughs> super fascinating. And for me, it just kind of is another warning sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Said I'm skeptical. <laughs> So while we're talking about big trends, really? the, uh, the big trend this year is, is AI, um, machine learning, uh, generative AI. I, I know Morningstar did a demo earlier this year where you, you know, had a... He's right here at the booth. <laughs> okay, well, you can check out Mo um, and, and talk to him. Um, but I'm wondering, like, what the real applications of that are and um, what uh, usage advisors might actually get from interacting with these technologies in the short, medium term? Let me start? Okay, so we think about AI um, as being applicable in multiple stages sort of of the journey. And so interestingly enough, sort of flashback, some of our automation has been confused in the world as AI, and it's not AI, it's automation. Um, and I think what we see is there's sort of back of office places where AI can be really powerful, and there's front of office places. And so we think about it in sort of three pillars. The first is how do we just make our operations more efficient in order to lower the cost to serve, right? So our coders can code faster, right? There's just like a lot of real, our marketers can do first drafts. You know, in every uh, discipline, we see opportunities for, for AI to accelerate the work of the humans. So that's kind of one, that's a cost area and an efficiency area. Two would be customer service, where we're seeing, you know, the first sp spot would be chatbots, but the idea that we can de deflect and answer questions kind of faster and well, so that really the hardest questions are left to the humans, there's a way to really, we're seeing really positive results there already. Um, and then the third, I think, is this question of like, you know, is AI going to replace the advisor? And we don't see that. I mean, our view is like between hallucination and there's just too much in the fiduciary responsibility that we believe remains with humans. But again, can we think about as advisors how to have AI accelerate our ability to deliver great service by getting us answers behind the scenes and then having us interpret those answers is kind of where we think, at least for the medium term, the, the opportunity stops. Yeah, everything Sarah said is uh, accurate and I would agree 100%. There are simple and complicated applications of it and I think you should not feel daunted by it. Um, but what I will say is I think it will change the way you interact with clients, because I think it's inevitable that all of us are going to continue to become more willing to just interact with robots or AI to get answers. And so the way you interact with your clients and what you ask them and where you spend your time will change. And so what you were referencing earlier, we, we've spun up um, a um, essentially an AI chatbot and put a you know, avatar on it, it's at our booth, he's called Mo, and he's, Mo's been around since April now. And there's two ways that we do this. So one is that you, you actually see this, you see Mo, which is in, in an avatar form, or you go into our products, and it's just a chat bot. And one of the things that we found super interesting is in our products, 
when our clients are interacting with the AI, the questions, and then they don't see a human face, the questions tend to be very technical. Help me do this. Help me find that. Um, can we figure this out? Give me this methodology. And then you start reading the questions that are being asked of the same chatbot, but with a human face suddenly, and they're all these personal questions uh, that they would normally be asking you. And at first I was sort of surprised by that, and then I kind of came to realize that this is sort of the pace of things in terms of how we're getting used to things. And so I think you'll have an opportunity to think about how you use AI in your practice, because your clients are gonna be comfortable not requiring you to pick up the phone and answer every question for them in the way that maybe you've been used to. And instead, you can use AI and things like that to know when it actually makes sense for you to reach out to your client. And really, as we've been talking about, think of yourself as a broader service provider in a way that maybe is now becoming fairly obvious. But I, I think AI really empowers you to do that. And so um, it'll take some time to shake out, but your clients are going to ask a lot of personal stuff to the AI and maybe more so than you. And you're going to have to be comfortable with that. So how, how did you come up with the name Mo? Mo for Morningstar? Oh. It, does it Mo wear those it, shoes? It, it, Mo does have those shoes. Yeah. Um, he's actually got a Hawaiian shirt now. and Stand totally up and show well. the shoes. Yeah, we've got these cool Morningstar shoes. So if you haven't seen them, we're giving them away. Um, kudos to our marketing team. You can go to the booth. And uh, they, they reflect the evolving investor. So. Okay. Yeah, the only thing I'll add on AI, um, so we leaned in really hard uh, with an Apex just to, again, create automation, right? There's plenty of opportunities. The one part that um, I will say is every one of the departments Apex come ba came back to me and said, hey, there's a vendor that we think can automate this thing. Um, and we can find ourselves, everyone's out there sort of peddling and sort of under the banner of AI. Um, and so what we've done is taken a different approach, which to the extent you have uh, resources at your firm, is hire some folks that are focused on AI rather than outsourcing uh, the functions. And um, what we found is that there's a lot of small, low-hanging fruit, right? So a good example is we have a chatbot. We haven't named it. I think it's Ask Apex. Um, through Slack, we took our employee handbook uh, and our standard operating procedures, loaded them into uh, GPT, and just created an employee ability to ask questions, and name questions that they would call HR or somebody within you know, the administrative side of Apex. What are our holidays? What's our T&E policy? Um, and it's small things like that that will continue to sort of um, you know, sort of create more and more opportunities for us to lower the friction within the firm. So, the, you know, the, the point there is, uh, before you just step across and outsource the function, um, just look at what's actually under, underlying the, the sort of uh, the consultant or the person, the vendor that's coming to you. Uh, and again, secondly, to the extent that you can afford to do so, again, I think it's been really powerful for us to get a couple of folks inside of Apex to solely focus on that as, as sort of the AI experts within the firm. Okay, we've got a, just a few minutes left, and so we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so I think we touched on this a little bit. How do you see AI and machine learning reshaping personalized uh, financial advice and investment strategies? Um, yeah, well, I wouldn't add a whole lot myself to that. What I think is interesting and what we didn't spend time on is personalization as a ma major trend. And I think that's a huge opportunity because you're going to have the tools and technology to personalize in a way that you've never had before. And I remember, you know, it used to be that you put a client in a separate account and that was considered personalization. The future is where you're basically going to be able to sit down with a client and talk to them about their preferences, however they're expressed. And you're going to be able to build a portfolio that will deliver that. We're calling that direct indexing today. Only the financial services industry could come up with a name like that. Um, nobody actually understands what it means. But um, I, I think that is the future. And certainly, AI is a very important input into how you're going to be able to do that. Good. If anyone else has any questions, you can hit the Slido uh, really quickly. Um, I, I'm wondering, uh, before we wrap up, each of you, like, what do you see as the biggest challenge that you face in your organization um, 
right now, Bill, other than, you know, uh, leaving sometime soon? I, a phrase I use a lot uh, recently is just embrace the grind. Um, markets are, are down. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of M&A activity. The IPO markets is, is off. Um, and so embrace the grind, right? We have sort of a path. We know what the path is at Apex around supporting advisory, around us building out a uh, SaaS platform, uh, continue to obviously support the, the fintech community. Um, and we know exactly what the plan is, right? We know exactly kind of, okay, what the steps we're going to take. So embrace the grind, right? We just got to lean in and continue to work hard. Um, as an organization, um, the markets will take care of themselves, right? The market, you know, ebbs and flows, right? We're in a bit of an ebb as far as the market will come back as the Fed lowers rates at some point. Uh, and, um, you know, we just got to kind of lean in and keep going. Our biggest challenge, this is maybe more inward looking, um, is that we're still a pr relatively small organization. We have about 400 employees. And we, tr we are trying to serve three customer segments really, really well. A, a, a retail segment, the advisor community, and me small and medium-sized businesses with 401k plans. And those are three audiences that all deserve, you know, tons of R&D and excellent service. And keeping up with all three of those as a relatively small organization, you know, competing against big, big companies and big, big brands, um, you know, is what keeps me up at night. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, one, one thing I'd just point to is we're all awash in data. And Morningstar is a firm that has kind of built its reputation on data and research. And all I would say is that getting people in every part of the organization to look at data to make decisions is really always an opportunity and a challenge. And I just say that because our ability to gather more types of data, to react to it, to use it to inform our decisions is greater than ever before. And most importantly, to use it to help you is greater than ever before. And getting people focused on that is an opportunity as much as it is a challenge. So both sides of the coin. OK, so we're running really low on time. There's one question that is probably not going to be answered in the next minute. But there is another question. How many shoes did Morningstar bring? Enough. <laughs> And also, uh, does anyone else have any cool swag that you want to tell us about before we leave? Uh, we have pickleball uh, paddles over at, at the Apex booth. So come on over and grab some. Shoes. Um, umbrellas. <laughs> OK, cool. Which, which, you know, in the sun might be really great. Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap up. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks, everybody, for being thanks here. Thanks for all the questions. Yeah. <laughs>